So we are here today at the uh, Fairmont Royal York Hotel. Uh, we're about to interview Hugh McQueen, and the interviewer, as usual, will be William McCray. Uh, so we're going to start with the basic question. Could you please state your full name? My name Hugh James McQueen. And could you please state your age? Yes, I'm uh, a a 83. And where were you born? I was born in Scotland. Whereabouts? Al Alloa, a small town between Glasgow and Edinburgh. And um, as a child, what did your parents do? Uh, my father initially was working in uh, uh, making spirits in a, in a plant. However, he had trained in his youth as a riveter a hand riveter in the shipyards, okay, and uh, that industry had kind of fallen apart after World War One, okay, uh, and so, uh, it, but, but the thing in terms of affecting me uh, was that in the opening of the war in 1939, uh, when I was seven years old, was my father switched back to the shipbuilding and repair industry, and he spent the whole of the war uh, in, in that field. Okay. How, however, uh, because of the German bombing of the Clydebank shipyards, uh, uh, I, I didn't live in, in the actual town. We didn't live in the town, we lived a little further away. Uh, but he, he put us down to, to, to uh, go to Canada to, to uh, uh, an uncle who, who was related to my wife. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, to, related to my mother. <laughs> okay, and so we left in 1942 uh, only. Okay, and uh, so uh, I finally got to Montreal and uh, 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 I, they had treated us very nicely as refugees and everything went well and my father finally came only in 1948 because of the difficulty of getting out of England and sorts of, all sorts of complexities which I'm not in detail but anyway uh, 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 so uh, uh, I was in high school then by the time that he came back okay and one of the, I was at Darcy McGee High School, which is a, 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 one of the Catholic high schools of the Montreal region. I was very active in the cadet corps, r r r going up to the rank of major. I mention that because uh, in my next one of my next steps, I ended up in the reserve army, uh, training as an officer. Okay. Uh, uh, so, okay, I'll let you ask another question. No, no, that was good, okay. that was good. So, uh, one of my next questions was going to be, um, did you perhaps gain interest in uh, that kind of metal work, metallurgy from your dad? Uh, not precisely, okay. Uh, in the riveting business, he, 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 he was an, an expert riveter, as a hand riveter, two men striking with a hammer blows and the third man holding it on the other side of the ship hull, you know. Uh, uh, his interest was, he kept saying, I should become a chemical engineer. Okay, and uh, uh, but he certainly was very definite that I should get finished university. Okay. Now, of my generation, uh, of my relatives in Scotland, okay, uh, none of them went to university. Okay, so I'm just saying there's a quite a big, mm -hmm. big difference. What? Because of partly because of my father's attitudes. I mean, I think he always felt. Uh, at a lack because he never went to high school. I mean, he had to go, go in directly from grade school into uh, the program of, of application. Uh, so that was one of the strong factors so, in me going to university. Okay, so he wanted, that was clear, you, were, you had to go to university, or you were highly encouraged to. Uh, that's right, and I didn't really have any pain in doing so. Yeah. I mean, uh, uh, in the high school, I had been one of the two or three top students, okay. Uh, however, uh, uh, because of our strong Catholic backgrounds, I decided to go to Loyola, high, to Loyola College, which was a Jesuit university at the time, okay. And it was a pre-engineering program that I took there, and it also included uh, annual courses in philosophy and theology, 
Okay, and so I got a Bachelor of uh, Science uh, uh, at, that, at that point with certain conditions put onto it, which made it valuable conditions, which made it possible for me to go into fourth year engineering at McGill. Uh, and so I did the last two years of engineering at McGill in metallurgy. Okay, and, uh, and th that proved uh, quite satisfactory. So you had found your, your calling? Uh, uh, y yes, I think of the different branches, I thought me metallurgy was the one which I, I liked, would like the most. And I haven't been... Uh, Disappointed. I, I, that worked out very well. <laughs> yeah. Um, what was your first official job? What would you consider um, being your first official job in the field? Well, now, th that would have to take me beyond my doctorate, if you want me to talk okay. about that. Uh, uh, but I thought you might look more, sure, yeah. more of my education. Going to your yeah, doctorate oh, okay. as well. Oh, sure. oh, there's one thing I should just mention is that when I was at Loyola, uh, I was in uh, uh, the COTC Canadian Officers Training Corps, okay, in, in, the, in, in the engineering uh, corps, okay, and so I spent three summers in that activity, okay. Uh, on the third summer, where you were supposed to get uh, experience, but you know, no, no more courses, kind of, I ended up in Germany uh, with the Canadian Brigade uh, that was going to help defend Europe from the Russians, okay? And so, for example, one of the duties that I had when I arrived is I was sent out to draw up new plans to blow up all the bridges on a 50 mile wide, wide domain. Okay, and then after I drew my plans up, then I sat down with some of the more experienced officers and they got out the old plans and we compared my, my suggestions with the previous suggestions. And I mean, generally everything was in pretty good order, but you know, those were all set up, the, the explosives were in storage, and we had visited these sites and we were ready to go out and blow up the bridges. Blow up the bridges. Okay, so uh, when I went to McGill, I had finished with the engineers, and I decided I didn't want to be really in engineering Pardon me, in the army, I found out that in my period in Germany, there was more done in terms of bureaucracy than otherwise. But uh, I mean, I, I, I wouldn't say that this was overly, but just there was, it was a necessary thing to keep up the morale of the men and, and things like that, okay? And so uh, in my intermediate summer before graduation, I worked for. Uh, 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 the Titanium Corporation uh, 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 in Tracy, Quebec. So that was a new, fairly new plant, okay? Uh, and then at the end of my studies at McGill, I had met a professor fr from uh, uh, Notre Dame in the field of X-ray diffraction, and so I decided to go there uh, 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 for my graduate studies. And uh, I spent five years there uh, it, it was uh, a good situation for viewpoint that I, I had more money at the end than I had at the beginning, kind of, you know, and uh, uh, my field of studies was sintering. That, that's where you take powdered materials uh, 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 and compress them into a shape which is not uh, fully dense. You know, you get around 80-85% 80, 80, density and then you heat them in a furnace uh, below the melting point uh, and gradually uh, uh, the vacancies depart, uh, the, ho pardon me, the holes depart uh, uh, because the metal begins to uh, pull itself together by means of self-diffusion. Okay. Uh, uh, okay, so, so the, I've gotten my degree. <laughs> so that was your thesis? That's that you was my on. thesis. Oh, okay. But when I, okay, I was looking around for jobs and uh, I decided ultimately that I wasn't going to go to industry. I should just mention that at that particular point in time, which was 1961, 
there was a great demand for, for grad, PhD in uh, metallurgists, okay, so there was no lack of jobs. However, I decided to return to Montreal and took a, a, a job as a, 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 an associate professor, uh, uh, associate in no, one lower the, the one lower rank than that, uh, uh, anyway, <laughs> at Ecole Polytechnique. Okay. Okay. Uh, okay, a any questions at that point? Or? No, they had a good uh, mining department, didn't they? I'm sorry? They had a good mining department as well, didn't they? Pretty technical. Uh, th that didn't concern me whatsoever. Uh, uh, the metallurgy was a separate department. Okay, completely and, separate. And, 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 and so I never interacted on mining. Uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the person who was running it was Andre Hohen, who had come from Alcan. He had gotten his doctorate in the States some 20 years before and worked for, in the Alcan laboratories uh, in, in that intervening time. Okay, and uh, so he, he was quite keen to, to build up the department. I was the second PhD person working in the department, aside from, in addition to him. Uh, uh, and there was two people, two, two French Canadians, who were actually working on their doctorate there while they were actually teaching. So uh, they had had some experience in industry, but uh, in general, it was difficult at that point to, to, to get uh, candidate, get prof professors who had a doctorate degree. Now, one of the advantages which I had, perhaps, in some ways, is that uh, in my last two years at, at, at uh, Notre Dame, uh, electron microscopy came in, okay, and uh, I didn't do any research on the electron microscope, but I did kind of take one course in it. Uh, 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 because it's quite complicated compared compared to optical microscopy, quite different. Okay, and so uh, uh, that that I decided was, was something that I wanted to do. Okay, uh, but we're still with some vagueness. Okay, and when I went to Polytechnic, they they pulled together the cash and bought an electron microscope for me. <laughs> nice. You see. Uh, uh, so that worked out. Uh, that worked out very well. But now I had to find projects. Okay, so at that point uh, uh, I uh, met John Jonas, who had been who graduated from McGill two years before me, and he had just come back from Britain, having gotten a a, a doctorate in which he was manufacturing ball bearings. Okay. Uh, 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 and he was kind of sick and tired of ball bearings, and uh, uh, and he had an extrusion press, so he started extruding aluminum. Okay, now from searches in the literature, it became kind of evident that people didn't know an awful lot about what was happening in the metal at the high temperatures. Okay, and. Uh, my, I should just mention that my analyses at that time were proven to be correct from the viewpoint that for the next 10 years I kept looking for this uh, 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 and to some extent there was no uh, uh, good work done, I shouldn't say no good work, there was no uh, uh, thorough work done on the microstructures uh, 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 of hot work material, okay. Particularly uh, uh, the hot work material uh, uh, there were too many variables. First of all, people rolled it industrially, uh, you know, in various kinds of mills, reversing mills, continuous mills, a mill which you went back and forth between two mills, and uh, the, obviously each one was reversing and so on. So uh, uh, it was very confusing in terms of, of, of what was happening. Okay, what was happening during the deformation, what was happening between the passes of the multi-stage mill, what was happening at the end of, of, of the rolling operation or in between the, the, the breakdown mill and, and the continuous mill, all of these things caused great a complex, possible complexity. So people hadn't gotten answers easily, okay, and of course, it's if if you're doing things in a in say a continuous mill, the sheet flies off at very high speed. Okay, 
and uh, perhaps you're going to be able to get, catch a piece off the end of, 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 of the product, okay? Because the front end of the product is still moving, mm -hmm. okay? And of course, you're trying to get the material before it, 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 it uh, undergoes uh, uh, transformations uh, and you mean transformations and of course at that point in time almost no one was trying to cool the run out material I mean there was no particular advantage to them so like the high strength low alloy steels were, were is critical uh, uh, to t transform the material in a special cooling region before you coil it okay so that that was all unknown at the time okay okay so Anyway, I and John Jonas uh, teamed up because he had an extrusion press and was extruding aluminum and he was doing optical microscopy but he, he, he didn't have a, an electron microscope. And in fact, electron microscopy had not yet been applied at, at, at the hot work and I was one of the first people who did apply it to, to that range. Okay, And there certainly was a number of pieces of evidence that tended to indicate there were some very interesting features. Because I had already mentioned that people did try to do this, but there was always all sorts of problems in heating or cooling, okay? And one of the things that I might say, like at the end of the hot, of the hot breakdown mill, if one took a specimen out of steel at that point, then it was always recrystallized. I mean, that's... That, because of the thing complications of trying to get the specimen and so on, okay, and then of course in the continuous mill, again that is so difficult that it was very unclear. In the case of aluminum alloys, where people had more opportunity to, to, to do things, they weren't working with such large products. Temperature ranges were much narrower. There wasn't any phase transformations after the after the hot mill and all these other things. Uh, they, they had mixed results, okay? They had results that sometimes things were re recrystallized as far as one could make out from the optical microscopy that must have been a, a, a static recrystallization just like you get in annealing, okay? Uh, 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 but at other times uh, the, the grains were still elongated uh, 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 and Andre Hohn had discovered a method of, of, of uh, 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 using uh, 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 a, a, a technique uh, uh, whereby one could pick out the substructure, okay, and, and so it would appear uh, that there was some substructure in the material. This was an optical technique, okay, which only gave sensible results over a quite narrow range, say uh, uh, from around 350 uh, at the 500, one could get good optical micrographs. At lower temperatures, uh, 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 everything kind of faded out because it was too small a scale and the etching didn't work properly. Okay, so John Jonas had been doing that uh, uh, with with his specimens, uh, but I was centered on the electron microscopy. Okay, okay. and so. Uh, uh, I worked for, for five years at Polytechnic and uh, the last three years were mainly devoted to, to uh, the development of hot work substructures in aluminum. Okay, And uh, I can say that at the point of publication of, of, of our first papers, John and I produced uh, approximately five joint papers Okay, uh, uh, and my contribution was the electron microscopy Okay, and so prior to that, there was one paper in which a person had published one electron micrograph of a piece of hot worked aluminum. Okay, and this is because uh, they, everybody was kind of restrained by what, what, what they, equipment they happened to have. And of all the hot working areas or, or schools, universities, and so on, none of them had an electron microscope directly in their control. Okay, so. Uh, it, 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 it by around uh, uh, nineteen, uh, it would have been say nineteen sixty eight, sixty nine. Uh, 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 we had published more pictures on, on the hot working of aluminum uh, uh, than than anyone else ha had. Mm. Okay. Uh, one of the amusing <laughs> incidents is that 
the, the papers were published in international actions except the final paper which was going to be published in the Canadian Journal of Physics because there was a, a conference held uh, 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 in Canada to, uh, uh, to consider electron microscopy. Where this, so, so this was in uh, uh, say uh, uh, 69 approximately and so they had an electron microscope uh, at the government labs at, uh, NRC, at NRC, mm -hmm. okay, and so we went forward and put forward our paper and that was the first time in which we had enough data to be able to draw up graphs of how the subgrain sizes vary with temperature and strain rate. Okay, and so that was, uh, uh, I mean, prior to that we had a lot of micrographs which you were showing and you could sh see, of course, that they were getting uh, uh, larger subgrains as the temperature increased or the strain rate decreased, okay. Uh, and th this could be confirmed to some extent by uh, uh, work on creep, okay. I should mention that at the point when I first started here, there was data of subgrain formation in creep specimens of aluminum. And this was possible using x-rays because the subgrains were approximately, uh, you know, three or, or f ten times larger than what we got in hot working because there are low strain rates, okay, and, 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 and so, uh, but, but uh, you couldn't use x-rays at the high strain rate material because the subgrains were too small. Okay? <laughs> I mean, so you had all these confusing factors uh, entered in. Now the amusing thing was that the editor from NRC, who, who was a, a, a very important electron microscopist by this time, uh, he decided not to, uh, 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 not to accept our paper for publication. Okay, <laughs> so that started a battle. Uh, 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 and by this time I transferred to Energy Mines and Resources uh, for a few years. They had very good equipment there uh, and uh, uh, the head man there who was also quite a prominent metallurgist, I went to see him and we discussed my, our results and so we went to the editor of the Canadian Journal of Physics and complained and we had a meeting with the editor of the proceedings editor of the journal. I mean, the, the, it was going to be a special edition of the, of the journal for about 300 pages, okay. So uh, he made the decision, yes, that our work was valid and it was going to be published, so. Uh, that, why, why did they want to in the first place? Why did they? Why did they refuse in the first place? Well, this, this guy who, who, who was uh, uh, the main organizer of the conference and who was also a very precise electron microscopist, okay, and who was very expert in doing electron microscopy at room temperature and down to liquid helium temperatures, uh, didn't like some of the approximations that we had to make because of the fact that we had to try to capture our specimens and quench them and do some other things and he didn't think that uh, our quenching was fast enough or you know many other things okay. which you could bitch about uh, 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 but uh, in the long run I mean we obviously did improve these techniques o o over time okay mm -hmm. okay uh, 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 so any questions on that period so, no no that's good so then you said you made it to um after after um, Polytechnic, where did you go? Oh, oh well, <laughs> I went to Energy Mines and Resources to the Metal Physics section, okay. and I actually continued doing hot working there. And the big thing that I was working on there was trying to do hot working of copper, okay, because it was expected that copper uh, would undergo a, another change, and that would be to uh, recrystallize at some point either during the deformation or after the deformation, okay, and uh, so I set out on one group of experiments on the rolling mill uh, 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 and the problem that I had finally with that was that the rolling rate was too high and the copper did not recrystallize in the rolling mill, okay, 
but it did recrystallize very rapidly, okay, right after it came out of the mill. And so we, we, the specimens were about that long and only a couple of inches wide and, and, and you know, one centimeter thick to begin with and they were dropped immediately into a, a salt bath, a sub-zero quench tank. And so the last half inch of the specimen uh, 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 had not recrystal. Uh, pardon me. Uh, it was cool. Had not statically recrystallized. Though, okay. I mean, because uh, 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 obviously, if you deform the material, uh, uh, when it comes out of, uh, out of the hot working mill, it's got a lot of dislocations in it, uh, 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 and therefore it will statically recrystallize. Okay. So uh, uh, anyway, I, I then went to a torsion machine, uh, a very old torsion machine which existed uh, uh, in energy mines and resources. Uh, 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 and uh, again, we tended to get, we got into the problem that we couldn't get the thing quenched fast enough. Okay, now, now in the torsion machine, you have a thing in the machine, and we couldn't get it out of this machine. We couldn't get the specimen out because of the way the machine was built. Okay, uh, 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 and so the problem was how do we quench it? Okay, and so I had built the thing with two buttons. You press the stop button, and then you press the quench button. Okay, and, and that difference in intensity of time, which was only uh, seconds, okay, was always too slow. Okay, <laughs> and suddenly I got the right idea. Well, the idea is I'm going to press the quench button first. Okay, and this means that the specimen, to some extent, was a break on the machine. So you quench the quench button, press the quench button. This specimen cooled down and got harder and, and then you, you stopped you didn't delay but just because of the way the machine it was a very old machine built, built in this in the second world war so then you hit the second button and it stopped completely okay but in this way we were able to quench in the dynamically recrystallized substructure and and grains okay and, and, and so i was one of the first people to be able to publish uh, electron microscopy uh, of the complete range of temperatures of, of, of dynamic crystallization in, in, in copper. Uh, now this had to some extent uh, confirmed uh, uh, the works of the people at Sheffield uh, uh, who had been doing torsion tests and had been quenching but they didn't have an electron microscope yet uh, which could study the inside of the grains. They could see the grains were else still elongated. Okay. So, uh, 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 therefore, uh, 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 I did quite well on that, that score as well. Okay. Okay, so, so that brings me uh, up until 1968. Okay. Now, I really was always interested in getting into the teaching field. Yes, I was okay. going to ask you, why did you choose a more well, academic uh, uh, or industri uh, uh, industry? Uh, there were certain factors, but one of the things was energy mines and resources did have a good microscope. They had also some very good backup people and so on. And they also had these machines, uh, which uh, I wasn't able to, uh, 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 to get a hold of. Uh, anywhere else, okay. The, the, the rolling machine at McGill uh, uh, wasn't wasn't really fast enough and wasn't good enough to, uh, uh, to go on beyond aluminum. And so, I mean, I also did uh, copper uh, and stainless steels uh, and brass uh, uh, in that big rolling mill, but I couldn't quench things fast enough. So then I did the copper in torsion, okay. So I decided to go back, I wanted to go back to university uh, and uh, the place that came open was uh, Sir George Williams University, which is now Concordia, okay, and uh, they had had a chemistry professor teaching material science. Uh, they, had, they graduated their first class in 68, but they had decided that they had to open up and get more professors now, okay. so. so uh, they hired, I think, four professors who all had PhDs the uh, uh, same year as I was hired into Jerome Mechanical. Okay, and uh, whereas of the people 
who were there before us. There was about three or four professors who had been working for five years to get the first class out. And I don't think any of them had a doctor. Maybe one had a doctorate, okay? Because in the old days, like when I was going to McGill, uh, 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 only about half the staff had had doctorates. Mm. I mean, it just wasn't so common in those days. Okay. Yeah, it's a lot more common now. <laughs> it's absolutely necessary. Yeah, it's, now. it's required in <laughs> most schools. <laughs> yes. Okay. So, uh, anyway, things pr proceeded at Concordia, uh, and we were uh, quite dynamic. And just to look at the research areas, okay, after about three years, it was becoming evident that we had two good research programs going by that time, neither of which was mine, because the other groups were more mechan were obviously mechanical, uh, 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 and they were able to work together. I was the only metallurgist in the whole university, okay, and so I continued uh, 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 to work with Jonas, okay, on and off to some extent. But anyway, Jonas and I made plans that we had to get a torsion machine, okay, and so uh, I traveled the world uh, looking for torsion machines, and uh, there was one at Sheffield, uh, which was a mechanical, totally mechanical machine. There was one at Ursa. They were the first people to really do good torsion tests, but again, they were a mechanical machine and had only experience on steels, okay, uh, which caused them certain problems and, and so on. So they, I mean, like, had, had not been able, and they didn't have an electron microscope, and so they weren't able to confirm what was happening in the steels, okay. But I finally ended up in Australia at uh, Broken Hill Steel Company, okay, uh, and was able to do a half sabbatical there. Uh, uh, and they had a, a, a very good torsion machine, the most recently built mechanical torsion machine. Uh, what the head of the laboratory had been a professor at, at Sheffield, okay. Uh, he and his buddy at Sheffield, his buddy Mike Sellers, stayed on at, 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 at Sheffield and became quite prominent and, and hot working. I mean, uh, 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 but a friend who went out to uh, became head of the laboratory, and so he set up a good hot working section, and so I went there for sabbatical, and so. Uh, I found out the, the, the in, in inconsistencies of problems of trying to use a fully mechanical machine, okay? And so uh, when we went forward at McGill, which we started the very next, uh, when I got back to, to Concordia, uh, was to, to go with a hydraulic machine. So, so uh, this is one of these two things. Uh, it, it, it has several valves. Two servo valves on your rotor control thing, and, and, and so uh, when you press it to, to reverse directions or to stop, I mean, you not only stop the flow in one of them, but you put flow into the other one in the opposite direction, so it stops. Okay, and so that seemed to be uh, the only answer. And, and so by this point, John and I had reached a concordat that, that an, an agreement with the people in my department that I would do my research at McGill, okay, and, and that I could uh, go in with John Jonas to get equipment from N NRC or NSERC later. Where was Jonas at this time? Where did he work? Oh, he, oh Jonas had always been at McGill. He, he, okay. Uh, okay, even when you were at Polytechnic. Uh, yes. Oh, that's, that's right. Yes, I mean, I came back to Polytechnic, as I said, and uh, shortly, about uh, a year after, I think, Jonas came back to McGill from okay. uh, from his ball bearing work, yes. okay, <laughs> and he had already started the work on the hot rolling of the aluminum, okay, uh, uh, but as I said, he, he was only able to do an optical microscopy, and so I took, uh, did the rest with electron mm -hmm. microscopy. Now, uh, uh, so that work approximately finished at the time uh, 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 the graduate the student graduated and left, and, and John actually started working with with Atomic Energy Commission (ACL) and went there every summer for for, for a few years, and uh, and they had electron they had uh, and were doing a lot of work on zirconium uh, and alloys of that nature. Okay, and so he worked with them and, uh, and so on. Okay, but anyway, he would come, but he only went there for the summers. Okay, so we decided that we really had to get a hot torsion machine. They didn't have a hot torsion machine at, at AECL. 
okay, and, and, and so we went with this hydraulic machine. Uh, uh, my graduate student, I happened to manage to get a graduate student from Pratt and Whitney who had been a, a very excellent student uh, in Hungary and he had just escaped from Hungary and, 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 and he hadn't been able to finish his graduate studies uh, 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 but he had to take a job to make more money. But anyway, he started part-time with me uh, 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 and he designed the torsion machine in detail of the hydraulic torsion machine. Okay, so basically you replace the motor of an or we use the lathe bed, okay, an ordinary, mo uh, the electric, pardon me, the hydraulic motor. And at the end, we had the usual thing, which, you know, you move back and forward, okay. Uh, 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 and so basically, uh, what you use, you use a tubular furnace, which is about that diameter. Your specimens uh, were about that diameter with a smaller gauge section, okay? And they were designed so that the end which went in uh, to the movable part was screwed in, okay? So it was very firmly, firmly head, held, and the other end had a baited attachment, meaning it was, it was a slot. Uh, uh, there was a slot in the holder and, and, and the specimen a holding thing was had a flat in it, and, and therefore that just slid in. Okay. okay, and so the ideal was that we would do tests inside the silica tube where we could watch the specimen and so on, and then when the test finished, we had to whip on the handle of this device at the end and the specimen came rolling out and once it got outside the tube, we sprayed water on it. And so we could get that done pretty quickly and I mean, we could do a copper and we could do uh, steels uh, and we could quench them quickly enough to be able to uh, freeze in the substructures, okay? And, and, and so Jonas and I collaborated on this for, I mean, on testing for about 10, 10 or 15 years after that. Uh, uh, and so uh, all, all our grants for equipment were joint grants. Uh, he was the leading author and they went, you know, they went to NSERC and so we gradually uh, built up a number of things. Uh, he, he decided ultimately to build a compression machine uh, 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 and you couldn't buy a compression machine either, the proper kind, and so that they had to buy an, an ordinary compression machine and change it all in order to do that. So his students did that project and so uh, uh, another thing which aided us a great deal is uh, uh, the Quebec government gave, started giving out research grants, okay, and one of the features was it had to be team grants, okay, so you had to have several re researchers. Now, it, 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 in my universe, in Concordia, I'll use the Concordia name, it's too hard for me to go back and forth. Yeah, for sure. Anyway, <laughs> in Concordia, we had these two teams and they immediately went into this mode, okay, and they did very well, okay, whereas in many of the older universities, like McGill, for example, uh, uh, many cases people had worked very long periods independently, and so they didn't actually uh, get into the team framework very well. But Jonas and I had already created a team, and so bang, we went to the Quebec government on the very first offering, and we managed to get a good grant from them. Okay, and, and, and so that helped helped us to build up the situation. At, at, at McGill, we also got money uh, to, to get an electron microscope uh, there, and, uh, and that went on used for about, about, about ten years. Uh, uh, so uh, uh, things went quite well at, at, at McGill in collaboration. John was doing a lot of work on zirconium and other things for atomic energy. I was concentrating on on on, on aluminum. Okay, he, he's, uh, we both started doing some steel work. Okay, and he got very interested in the steel work, and I kind of continued more on aluminum alloys of all different kinds. Okay, and so uh, after about 10 or 15 years, we started kind of splitting apart. Uh, 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 and, and so uh, ultimately, I can't remember the dates and all these things, but he finally became one of the researchers who was picked as being essential for the steel industry. 
okay? So this would have been, you know, in the 80s, I, I, I believe, okay? And so he started getting large research grants from NSERC and the steel industry, okay? Uh, and, and meanwhile, I, I was get, getting my grants, I built them up to some extent from NRC uh, or NSERC by that time. Uh, uh, but in general, uh, 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 I started taking more sabbaticals, okay? And so uh, uh, one of the things that intervened was in 1972 was the energy crisis. Okay, and I'm giving a paper on that here just now. Okay, this was a crisis where OPEC decided to double its price. Okay, and they, I mean, and they, at this point, the United States didn't have sufficient resources to stop them. I mean, and in terms of oil resources, neither did Canada. Okay, okay, so that was very effective for them. Okay, and now because of this, I got into the field uh, of so social aspects of engineering. Okay, and a lot of the information I got was was from the Science Council of Canada. Okay, uh, which had been in existence uh, for half a dozen years by that time. Okay, and they had been looking into all sorts of things, all sorts of problems. One of them, I'll say, is air pollution, okay? Now, that was the period of, of uh, the Trudeau government. Now, there was a the guy before that, uh, his name escapes me at the moment. Uh, he, he was a guy who had been, I mentioned him so you can check on it, uh, he was a guy who had been a, a, a great Canadian uh, 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 person on international... Pearson? Pearson, yes, okay. Yes. So Pearson came in, uh, okay, uh, 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 then he retired and and the government took over. Now, anyway, they had the attitude, of course, that science was supposed to help the government. I mean, the, the, the science would be a thing which was not just supposed to, but I mean, it would help the government. I mean, and the government would prosper if, if they could do, use the science, okay? And so one of the big things that was done was the pollution studies, and one of the most important ones was acid rain. Now, the results of that was not, of course, that the government hid under the carpet that there was acid <laughs> rain, okay? They decided, well, we've got to solve the problem, okay? And so they set up something like a hundred measurement stations across Canada, okay? And, and, and so they found out what the problem was and where the sources were, and they were uh, uh, quite willing uh, uh, to go after uh, uh, the, uh, the people in Canada, but more than half the pollution was coming from the United States, okay? So anyway, uh, uh, I got involved in this. I also got involved in running a program on what we call social aspects of engineering in which all the, graduate en all the graduating engineers had to take two courses uh, uh, in a, a, a variety of things related to, to the social consequences of engineering, That's okay? Uh, and uh, so, uh, anyway, that program ran up until '98 when I retired. I, I mentioned that I decided to take a sabbatical, where I went to a, 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 a university a, 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 in Manchester. Okay, and they had a program kind of in social aspects of science, okay? And so I applied <laughs> for a fellowship from the Canadian Council for the uh, for, uh, for Social Studies, okay? And they refused to give me one. So it turns out that the man who was the head of the Canadian, uh, 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 of the ministry in charge of science was, was the, was the politician from my from my hometown, like it was in Montreal, right. Westmont, Westmont NDG, okay? Uh, and so I went to him, okay, and I said, well, listen, you know, uh, looking at, at the data, uh, NRC does not give, uh, you know, money for sabbatical, uh, 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 you know, for, for this area. And, and this area actually falls under the, the Canadian Council for, for, you know, for Social Studies, okay? Now, uh, you know, you, you usually apply in, in September, October, and they give you the answer by January, but I wanted to go on sabbatical in June, okay? So I went and saw the Member of Parliament, and lo and behold, two months later, I get a fellowship 
from Canada Council, uh, which I uh, which I used, and that worked out very well. And so that got me into a lot of other things. And I'm giving a paper on on that here, okay? Because I, I got involved in all the things that were happening with respect to this energy crisis. And I also got onto the board of the Order of Engineers of Quebec, okay, and got involved in Quebec energy strategy and uh, uh, pollution problems and things of that nature, okay. But the big difference was in the whole atmosphere was that, was that the Trudeau government looked on scientists as something that were valuable, yes. okay, and used what they found and figured that what they found was good for the country. Okay, yeah, <laughs> and it proved that way. Okay, and so subsequent to that, things tended to roll down. I mean, you know, uh, 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 the, our great Irish tenor, who became the next prime minister, I forget his name at the moment. Uh, he, he, uh, he, you know, he, he kind of moved down to to, to a more. Uh, 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 reserve behavior and shut down some of the things that had been going on but I mean things went along but obviously over the years uh, uh, things went down and down and Is the liberals Mul went Mulroney? Mulroney was the guy who, who, who we can't complain about okay but when the liberals came back on again uh, they kind of maintained things but, but I mean at the end of their period uh, uh, where global warming was a problem, they, they didn't act, okay, and ultimately we ended up getting the Harper group, <laughs> whose attitude was that uh, uh, we're going to use science only if it agrees with our political position, okay. Uh, and so, like, they've been muzzling scientists. And I mean, this was so drastically different from the situation uh, under Trudeau, okay, and even under Mulroney. I mean, there was no, no thought of any of these things, okay. So, anyway, uh, one of the problems then that, that went on is that the, the equipment you need for steel research and for aluminum research and the microscopic te techniques and so on are somewhat different, okay. And so, John went forward. On working uh, on the steels, uh, and what I then did is I decided to, to, to follow up things internationally. Okay, okay, and and, and so uh, I I, I took my sabbaticals generally six months at a time, uh, and that way you get one every three, every three years, you know. And the school doesn't mind because what they do is they move your courses yeah, into the term that the, are there. Yeah. Okay, so. Anyway, I was very fortunate to, to, uh, to go to places like Hamburg, uh, University in Hamburg, uh, to the University in Trondheim. Now that was really uh, the best situation. They have uh, concentrated all of their work on aluminum research for the whole country. You know, they're very powerful in producing aluminum. Uh, uh, it's all concentrated in Trondheim at the time, okay? And so uh, uh, I, I went there and I had some ideas which I needed to pursue and they pursued these ideas and we got a, a, a very major study carried out uh, uh, on aluminum, which they hadn't been, they hadn't been looking quite at that area. Uh, and so that set me off on a good dozen or more, two dozen papers uh, uh, as you extended this thing. Okay, and then uh, uh, a few years later, I ended up uh, being nominated as a Humboldt Fellow for Germany. Okay, and this was in conjunction uh, with the University of Erlangen Nuremberg. Okay, Nuremberg was the headquarters of the university, but all the science faculties were at a small town called Erlangen. Uh, 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 so that's why it's named. And Erlangen is the most important campus now. But anyway, I went there, uh, and again, uh, I was very fortunate that, that there was a guy who was deeply involved in this case in creep. Okay, and what we decided to do was that we were going to uh, merge the gap between hot working and creep. It was about a difference of a, a 10 to the 3 per second between the regular work that people were doing. Okay, and he had the equipment that he could uh, jack up his speeds and creep, and I, I could take uh, the hot torsion test down by one decade. Okay. And so we enlisted uh, the German government who gave us an extra grant, 
okay, to do the research. I had the grant fr uh, 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 already f from uh, uh, you know, the Humboldt Foundation, okay, and, and I could spread that. It, it was a whole year's grant, but I could spread it over two half sab sabbaticals, uh, uh, okay, uh, and then we went to uh, 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 the aluminum company uh, 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 in Switzerland, okay, uh, uh, I'll use Swiss, okay, and because I knew the guy there, and he was very interested in my research, and so we got him to to to, to get a, a certain grade of aluminum, nothing particular, but a, a good quality commercial aluminum, and to make us uh, six alloys from that one thing, okay, and, and to make them always in the same methods so that we didn't get any more impurities. So the impurity levels in the aluminum and in all these alloys were the same, okay? And so we then spent a decade doing all the hot torsion tests at McGill because this machine was still there and doing all of the creep studies in Germany, okay? Uh, and uh, then we were different people uh, working on the electron microscopy. By this time, the electron microscope had begun falling apart, uh, uh, and, and so I had an had an Italian who had come to me as a post a postdoctoral fellow, uh, and he went back to Italy and got his own electron microscope, and he was doing a lot of electron microscopy for us. Uh, and some was done in Germany, just that we didn't have enough personnel there. But the people in in Germany also had a. a, a a, a, a scanning electron microscope, which you use back reflection, and, and, and so those were very powerful, okay? And, and then, to, to, to hurry things up, uh, uh, Gordana Avramovic Sangara decided, had spent a sabbatical with me, but then she decided to leave uh, the Balkans when they went under civil war, okay? And so she ended up with me, uh, and so we got into uh, aluminum lithium alloys, Okay, which Alcan was pushing at that point because everyone was doing that, and uh, the Air Force Base, Wright Patterson Air Force Base, saw, saw our results. They thought it was very good, and they, they, they offered us money, uh, a large sum of money. But I still didn't have an electron microscope, and neither did Gail have a good one. So anyway, we teamed up with the U of T at that point. Okay, and so Gordana moved to the U of T, uh, uh, and using the facilities here. Uh, I mean, in the city, okay, and she remained here and also spent some time at McMaster, uh, uh, but ultimately uh, the university uh, here got the, an OAM machine, uh, Orientation Imaging Microscopy, which was another advance, and they didn't have one at McGill at that time either, and, and she was became quite, two of us became quite expert in that, and so uh, 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 we spent a, a decade working on, on aluminum lithium alloys and, and then doing other work using the OIM combined with uh, with optical microscopy and so I'm uh, sorry with t regular transmission microscopy. Okay, and so there is a story that brings us to the end. I kind of speeded things <laughs> up. If you need more information of the stuff at the end, uh, 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 I can provide, you know, yeah, I can, you can always send provide, you email, contact me yeah, for sure. Montreal. I, I, uh, can, can I do one last question? Yes, okay. Because um, you, you spent a lot of your career teaching as well. Uh, yes. Um, so in the teaching perspective, uh, are there any standout uh, classes or um, specific <laughs> courses that, that you, that I guess are your favorite or you deem most rewarding? Yes, okay. There were three things. There were two groups of courses which I got very involved in. I mentioned the undergraduate one, and I had four courses which covered the whole field of metallurgy, and that was part of our manufacturing option, okay? And those four courses continued until the time, just as they were. In fact, the four courses continue until now, okay? But they have now gotten some different people and more, they basically got, I think, four researchers in materials now. <laughs> which covers those courses, for one thing, okay. Uh, 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 now, the other thing was that I decided I would like to get a graduate program going, okay, so this would be 19, early 70s, okay, and the thing was at McGill and the whole Polytechnic, 
they only offered graduate programs during the day, whereas Sir George was renowned as a night university. So we opened an evening program, uh -huh. okay? And this cashed in tremendously on ASM, okay? Because the ASM chapters were very strong in those periods, okay? And so there was a lot of technicians who also was in them. And so we ended up with this great, graduate program in the evening, first of all just a master's program uh, 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 and we would have about half a, do a dozen people from ASM and we then have a number of other people who were coming through our own program and would fit into this and so I taught three courses which were all related to the sub substructures, okay? And then the other thing which I did was I knew by this time all the people who were very competent in other things like casting and welding from energy, mines, and resources. So those guys came down and gave us each a course uh, in the graduate studies. Okay, so uh, uh, we had a, a, a well-running master's degree uh, uh, which could beat out the other two universities. Okay, and uh, then we finally went forward with a doctoral pro. Well, we had a doctoral program, uh, and I, I I only had three or four students who actually went through it. Okay, because you know we we weren't in a position to to, to have a lot of different things like McGill had, or you know. Mm -hmm. And so by this time, McGill was picking up. So so this would be uh, in, in the early eighties and so on. Okay, okay. and. Uh, so the last story to tell you about is Norman Ryan came, he was a welder from Australia. He, he, he came and started welding in the leading company in Montreal and after about five years he was the head welder, I mean, and he was the manager of the welding section and he had gotten married to a French-Canadian girl and they had two children and so he wasn't going to go back to Australia, okay, and so he decided that he would take his first degree at night at Concordia, you know, he did his a master's degree in education at an American university just south of the border uh, and so then he, he, he quit the welding company and went to teach in a high school, okay. At that point he decided he wanted to get a PhD in metallurgy, he came to see me, did that part time, okay, it took him around eight years or nine <laughs> years to get his PhD, wow. okay. And so after he got his PhD, then we hired him as a part time teacher. Uh, okay, and so he, he taught one or two of the courses which I had been teaching uh, uh, for a short period of time, uh, uh, okay, and ultimately we, we did the stainless steel work and so we've got something like 20 papers on hot working of stainless steels uh, as joint papers. Mm -hmm. So uh, we pushed forward in all these different areas. He lives uh, in Toronto now because his sons <laughs> Who are, are, are you know semi French Canadian decided that uh, Toronto was better than Montreal, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so he ended up in in in, in Toronto, uh, 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 and I'll see him for the banquet tomorrow. Okay, so all in all, we we managed to uh, manipulate things and and keep things. Going, going along, uh, although we never had a metallurgy department at, at Concordia. So maybe I'll stop at that point. Yeah, for sure. Well, thank you. I know you, I don't want to hold you back. So, uh, yes. Dr. McQueen, thank you very much. Okay.